Good morning again, everyone, near and far. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this Palm Sunday where we come to uh, see the sufferings and the triumph of Jesus Christ uh, during this whole week, Lord. And we pray that it, it may not just only be something that we celebrate about, but that you put something into our hearts, Lord, that make us fully aware again and grow a deeper appreciation for all you've done for us. We commit this service into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. I'm back. <laughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. And uh, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Today marks the beginning of the Holy Week, the beginning of the season of remembering all that the Lord has done and accomplished for us. So we want to encourage you as a church that uh, we will start preparing our hearts even as we enter into this week and start remembering all that He has done for us, culminating in the celebration of the Good Friday celebration this Friday, as well as Easter that is coming on this coming Sunday. So all the ministry leaders, we have forwarded to you some resources applicable to family, adults, young adults, youth, children. So please do take a look at that material that will be passed around by the ministry leaders to your respective groups and start focusing this week on day by day uh, what you call a meditation of what the Lord has done for us. Amen? And this Friday we will be having our Good Friday celebration. We are going to celebrate the Seder meal. What is the Seder meal? It is the Passover meal. We are going to celebrate the Passover meal together and we're going to understand how it has been fulfilled to the what you call a finest detail in the scripture in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So do come, make it a point to come, come and celebrate. It starts at 8 o'clock. We will send the information out to everyone. So at 8 o'clock, please do come. 8 p.m. Eight, we have service at 8, 8 a.m. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so 8 p.m., do mark it in your calendar. Do come together as a family because we are also going to celebrate Holy Communion together. Amen? So let's look forward this whole week, church, with expectation, anticipation from the Lord Himself. Amen? God bless you. Pastor Moses. Hi, good morning. I'm also back. So today is Palm Sunday. Uh, let me just read the passage that uh, you see on the screen and then I will go on to explain, uh, share the message. John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 34. And he said, where have you laid him? Here, the he is Jesus Christ. Where have you laid him? That's Lazarus, not Lazada. They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38, Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order for he had been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, that you see the glory of God? Verse 41, So they took away the stone. You notice there, there's a small little pictogram or small little picture or image. Can you see what's that? A palm leaf, right? A palm leaf. So I want to point that palm leaf to you for a special reason. It's like there's a break there. They took away the stone, pause, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, that point there where the blue palm is, is my whole sermon there. It took, it took place between the, in the middle of a sentence, okay? 
you'll see that afterwards. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Verse 43, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Palm Sunday refers to the entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. As Jesus enters into the city, the crowds cheered him as a king. They held palms in their hand and as part of the welcome of the, by the crowds to Jesus Christ, they waved and shouted, Hosanna, which means God save us. So that's why they call it Palm Sunday. It is also called Passion Sunday. Now, passion means strong feelings in English, but it also refers to a series of events. So taken from a theological point of view, passion means a series of events that took place after Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, his sufferings and also his triumph. So in this passage, uh, of, from now on, you will see events like the Passover meal that Mark mentioned, the arrest, the trial, the suffering or the humiliation of Jesus Christ, then the crucifixion, the burial also, the resurrection. This collection of events are generally called the Passion. So, we, when you see this cluster of events put together, they contain the victory of God and also the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Now that is how we understand what Christ's work is. There is triumph. And as we celebrate this time, we talk about the victory. But there's also the um, sufferings that he underwent. Traditionally, at least... By the time the church come to 300 AD, this is the pattern of service they had in the city of Jerusalem on how they celebrate Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday. There probably will be a procession. They had procession on the streets. They carry palms. They sing the psalms a lot. And that's one of the things they come to understand the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to find a theology for it, they, yeah, now then they had the New Testament, but much earlier, they had to depend on the Psalms to draw the biblical verses, the theology to back up what they are saying. And so the Psalms were one big source for them to put the theological groundwork for them to move on. Then there'll be passages they read, including Matthew's Gospel of Christ. Uh, arrest and crucifixion, the same with Mark 14, Luke 22, and so on. Although it is one event, Palm Sunday is one event, it opens up a whole number, a number of other events as well in Jesus' life. All that, they traditionally call it the Holy Week. So this is the start of that Holy Week. There will be things that happen uh, on certain days to highlight what they are. For example, Thursday will be the day they highlight the washing of feet by Jesus Christ. Those are the things that will fill in up the rest of the Holy Week. But the kicking off where it starts everything is the, uh, the entry of Jesus Christ on this Palm Sunday or the Passion Sunday. The four Gospel writers right, that wrote the four Gospels that we have, Basically, when they write the life of Jesus Christ, they ignore the first 30 years of his life. That's why gospel is not like a biography. A biography will spend equal time on the childhood of the person, uh, the, the person in the biography, or, and then they will talk about his achievements or his work and then his achievements and then he's dead. So there is a kind of a equal treatment of all these major events of a person's life. 
But in the case of a biography, as we see here, all four Gospels ignore, almost literally ignore, the first 30 years of the man's life. They were the hidden years, we say. And they are all kept aside. Nobody knows what happened to Jesus Christ. Even at the point when we know, he, at age 12, he went to the temple. But after that, there is a silent 18 years that we do not know what he did or what he said. And we really don't have all the data to kind of understand his whole life. That's why I'm saying it lacks all those material that make up what is called a biography. And then they spend 35% of their material on the last one week of Jesus Christ. Nobody go and buy a biography and find that one third, say it's about 200 pages, one third of those 200 pages concentrate about his death. What in the world kind of biography is that? So gospel is always different from a biography. And this, this thing... Because these gospel writers seem to think that if you don't understand this last one week of his life, you know nothing about Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, you can find his teachings in the other parts of the earlier parts of the gospel. But you never know what his heart, the very core of this person, is found in this one week. And that's why the church spent a whole week to talk about these events so that we may understand this man more. So it is that one Sunday that opens up many other events. Now come to the Gospel of John from which I've taken that passage for us for our Sunday reading. We all know that, we said many times here, that the Gospel of John is structured around uh, two halves. I mean, is divided into two books. The first book is called the Book of Signs. And then the second book is called the Book of Glory. In the book, first book of signs, he tells us seven miracles. Now, he did lots of miracles, remember? And, but the gospel writer, this John, picked only seven to talk about. And then he brings out teaching based on these seven miracles. And they are called signs for the simple reason they point to something. They point to Jesus as the divine Son of God. And the resurrection of Lazarus is the last miracle. It has similarities with Jesus' own resurrection that is to come. And as Jesus... Uh, come in this particular gospel, come to that point where I put the blue, uh, uh, whatever palm there is, to highlight to you. At that point, he began to stop and reflect. He's standing in front of the tomb and he's thinking, this man is going to be resurrected. I'm also going to be resurrected. And he began to compare what his resurrection is like and what this Lazarus resurrection is like. And from there, we are going to learn all the good things, the, the differences and the similarities to help us to understand our own Christian life itself. So, as he thinks about it, these are some of the things that he probably, Jesus probably thought. Yeah, at that, in, that point there, I showed you. The death and resurrection of Lazarus, the death and resurrection of Jesus. The first one, and Jesus thinking about Lazarus' death, he must have felt forsaken. Because when Jesus was told that Lazarus was sick, he did not hurry up and go to where Lazarus was. He stayed two days behind. It's just like you call 999 and the ambulance say, I'll come in two days' time. You mati. La. That's <laughs> what is it like? This kind of ambulance, tak boleh pakai. You don't want to call this kind of number. So it's like that. He, they call, send word to Jesus. And he stayed there purposely, you know, almost. So that you know, he, he can fulfill something God wanted to do, which I have I have read this many times, I still can't find the reason why he delayed two days. <laughs> strange, huh? But there are a lot of strange things in the Bible. 
that I don't understand. So during this waiting period, Lazarus must have, he was given no reason why there's a delay. And he would feel abandoned, wouldn't he? Wouldn't feel forsaken. This is my good friend. No? I send word to him and he has not come to help me. And slowly as his strength and health declined, he died. And by the time Jesus arrived at that village, which we know is Bethany, he has been in the tomb for four days already. A very long gap from the time he heard the sickness until he really arrived at that village. It's been a, at least six days. It could be more, right? but that's just based on the calculation. And he probably, Jesus knew he would be abandoned on the cross. We know that he took Psalm 22 verse 1 to help him cry out to God. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Some way, Lazarus also feel that. But I'm sure the sense of forsakenness in Jesus' case is much worse. Yeah, Lazarus know that Jesus is a friend of the family, a good friend who loves him. But in the case of Jesus, it was an entire separation from the father. For the first time in the, this father and son relationship, there has come a rupture because when Jesus went to the cross, he carried the sins of the world. And the Old Testament prophets say, the eyes of God are so pure that he cannot look upon sin. So when Jesus carried all the burden of our sin on him, the Father could not look at him. The Father turned his face away from Jesus. And that's when he shouted, My God, my God, why have, I, why have thou forsaken me? If you, we all understand that part. We can talk about it. But you can imagine two people face to face since eternity. And I don't know when eternity began. And right through the earthly years of Jesus, they have been face to face. Until that point on the cross, that relationship was rupture. There are commentators who say that Jesus actually died of a broken heart rather than through the wounds of the cross, of the weeping. If I know Lazarus can never, never say, why hast thou forsaken me? In the same degree as what Jesus has said to the Father. But here Jesus, standing in front of the tombstone, it crossed his mind that he will go through a deep forsaking by the Father. What else? Lazarus' case is a death by illness. But Jesus' case is death by the cross. The point I'm trying to drive at is, I, there may be some blood in that illness, but generally we can accept that. Whatever amount of blood that Lazarus shed through the illness cannot be compared with the amount of loss of blood in Jesus' life, in Jesus' death on the cross. You see, the crucifixion is designed by the Romans. The Romans experimented many, many ways to torture people. It's a form of torture. If you read Japanese uh, 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 cultural books, they have very, very ingenious way of torturing people. I won't want to describe to you because it will spoil your lunch. But when you think about that, why would a human being plan ways to make another human being so miserable? Huh? We all, the locals here who lived through the Second World War will tell you how bad it is. But there are worse things that they have invented, they didn't use, I think. Or as time has changed, you know, they don't have those type of things anymore. But I can't imagine, you can't imagine. People purposely plan for your pain. You can never fathom that. Why would a whole culture think like that? And they were good. And so with the Romans, they would have experimented many ways. 
and you get a medical doctor to explain what is really happening, it goes beyond just the slashing the nail wounds and so on. It's a very complex. All the different parts of your anatomy is being subject to different workings to make the worst of pain and the worst of humiliation. That's what they are doing. Let me go through quickly. Right? They, they whip him on the back. Now that whip is called the cat of nine tails. It's a stick with nine leather strips. At the end of the, each strip is either a bone or a stone. One slash on your back, you see the bone, your human bone. That was just how deadly it was. And people getting 39. Why never 40? It's 40 slash lashes, but the executioner will only lash you 39 times. In case he miscalculated, went to 41, he had to get one back. So they don't want to come so close to the exact amount of 40 in case he forgot to know how to count. Like some of us nowadays don't know how, know how to count. So he had to play safe. That's why they call it 40 less one. Just to keep safe. And then why does he cut that out? Cut your back out like that. It's so that they design the cross in such a way that you will never be able to sort of uh, lie down there. Because come a certain point at the cross, you need air more than anything else. Not food, not water, air. So you have to lift up your chest to take in the air. And as you lift up your back, okay, yeah, yeah, you know where that is coming from. You are you a better stop. <laughs> and slowly, as you lose more and more blood, the doctors will tell you that you go through a hypovolemic shock. And when you go through a hy hypovolemic shock, your electrolytes all get messed up. Your heart can beat and you literally die of what's the word? Asphyxiation. What? Suffocation. No air. It's not the wounds. I mean, it's indirectly caused the wound. But you lose air, cannot beat, you die. And there's a lot of blood loss. Blood is important in the Bible. Life is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So in Lazarus' case, he probably died a bloodless death. In Jesus' case, he died a very full of blood type of death. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Lazarus is not the saviour of the world, but Jesus is. He has to shed his blood and he has to shed a lot of his blood in that sense. This is Mr. James Harrison. He lived, he was born in 1936, like 2018, about six years ago. The Australians call him the man with the golden arm for the simple reason he donated a lot of blood. And his blood is like gold like that. What happened is at the age of 14, he had a, he had a need for a, heart a chest or heart surgery and required 13 pints of donated blood. So when he recovered, he was very grateful and he wanted to pay back to the community. So as soon as he reached the legal age to donate blood, which is 18, he started to donate his blood. Over time, they discovered his blood contained a very special... Okay, when I use medical words, it's not because I'm a doctor, but I don't know how else to say. Because you can talk as if like you're... <laughs> Dr. Quack, right? It contains a certain antigen. If this antigen is in the mother's, if this antigen in the mother's blood is negative and the baby's blood is positive, it can cause death to the child. So the doctors noticed that Harrison's blood contained a lot of this thing that is needed to prevent the death. So when he donated, they take part of the blood and kind of use that to help to become medicine for these pregnant mothers who need that. 
And he did that. They reproduce it in the lab, do something to it to make it available for other people who need it. Because of this, over 2 million babies were saved. As your blood, they say your one pint of blood can save about three people. He has saved 2 million babies. The baby that he held there in his hand is his own granddaughter. And the Australian government awarded it. When I think of this story, wow, one man's blood can save two million people. How many people can Jesus Christ's blood save? Uh, don't count. Uh. <laughs> it's too long to count. Too, take too long to count. Without the shading of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without any forgiveness of sins, you are doomed. You need help. And it's through the blood of Jesus that we find this help. Jesus stood there in front of the tomb of Lazarus. And he knows Lazarus had been buried. And he knows also that he'll be buried. This burial tomb of Lazarus, they are quite a rich family, will probably be his own. Because when he died, he, they automatically put him in his uh, family tomb. That's the custom there. And he bought it. And he was laid there. He was expected to be laid there for the rest of his death. <laughs> right? <laughs> for the rest of his death, he will be in the, his own tomb. And Jesus think about his own tomb. He borrowed it, bought it, he will borrow it from a man called Joseph Arimathea. Why he borrowed? And this guy stayed in his own because Jesus is only going to use it for three days. You go to a hotel, you book three days. But if you're going to permanently stay there, you buy the whole hotel. He doesn't need to buy it. Or he doesn't need to own it. You just go there, borrow three days. After that, he's getting out. Probably play, pay the owner free. <laughs> Nothing. Why? In this burial, that he, he's looking at this... Uh, Tombstone. This burial depicts also the work of Jesus Christ. When you think about it, while buried, Lazarus did no great work. Matthew, Dio, do it, cannot do anything about it. But when Jesus was three days in the tomb, you start to think, what did he do? He went down to hell. He had a very busy death. <laughs> I have to say that. He went down to hell. He preached to all those in the prison who had never heard the gospel before. He went down to hell. He whacked the devil. And he redeemed the souls. The devil required blood of someone sinless to let go of all those people. He showed his hands, he paid the price, and he opened up all the cells. And he let a host of prisoners free. The devil still wanted to cling on him, no? As he going up, at least to some place called paradise. The devil keep on trying to hold on to the souls that are set free. Jesus turned around, took his foot and just hit on the forehead of the devil. That's why what Genesis say, that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of, of the Satan. So today, if you want to, at the end of the last day, how you can recognize the devil is to go and check his forehead. No? The scar will still be there. And there's a little bit mark in his feet, which probably we all won't be able to see. And he did his greatest work while, and many more, I could go on and on to tell you how he transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. All the 
All done in the three days while he was in the cave. Which he borrowed lah. He was buried. But Lazarus did no great work. Jesus did the greatest work of his life. Saving the souls of people while buried in the grave. Think about it. When you are most hidden, when you are most weak, you are able to do the greatest work. When you are most hidden, you do the great, your great work. And all of us got to learn something here. That in Christian work, it's not just being seen. Yeah, it's a part we will be seen. In fact, our life consists of those things that are seen and those things that are not seen. And it is in the unseen that some of our greatest work is done. Are you following me? Because I sometimes think my ideas are a bit funny. But here we get the greatest work done while it is all hidden from men buried. And you and I will find that we do our greatest work when we are hidden. Which leads me to these verses. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of soul. Burial is a way we identify with all the great works that Jesus Christ has done. And while he was buried, he did all those things. He, uh, what you call, broke the power of sin so that we can, when, when we are baptized also, we share with the Jesus Christ that victory over sin. And on and on and on, we could go on to tell you all the Christian doctrinal things that we have called the efficaciousness or the effectiveness of Jesus Christ's work on the cross. All that is kind of like made available to us while he was buried. Whereas Lazarus did not offer us that. Another one, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So the burial is the place we uh, join Jesus Christ to partake of what he achieved at the cross. That's why we are asked to be baptized, so that we can be united with him, that we can be in union with Christ, And we too will do our greatest work when we are buried. Jesus, Lazarus was raised in the open. Jesus was raised in secret. It could be just like you would say, number three is very closely related to number four. He called the people to roll. Jesus told the people, in Lazarus' case, he told the people to roll away the stone and call his name, Lazarus, come out from the tomb. He, op- he rolled the stone, like he opened the door and called him out and he came out. There's a difference in this case with Jesus. He the stone was rolled and he was raised from the dead. With the stone rolled over the cave, huh? did you hear that? The door is closed. Lah. The door of the cave is closed. And the father raised him. You, you know what I mean? Because when the disciples come on early Sunday morning, they saw the stone still there. But Jesus is not inside there already. Now, all of you are looking at me funny, right? But you, did you know that? The stone was to keep Jesus in, but he chabot. The stone is not for us to try to go in. It's not to keep us out, right? It's to keep Jesus in. But cannot keep him in, no. Because when they rolled the stone, he was gone. Some apologists have said, never use the empty tomb to prove that Jesus rose again from the dead. It's a classical position we always say. Look at the empty tomb. Look at the empty tomb. That is a proof that we have a risen Savior. 
Actually, I find very hard to believe for right from the beginning. Why use an empty proof to some to prove something positive? Eh? It's, uh, I don't know how to tell you. But the point is, Jesus was raised inside the tomb. And he went out of the tomb like he went through the doors when he went to meet the disciples on, in John's Gospel, chapter 21. He walked through the doors. He walked through the walls all the time. So what is a cave? Nothing. He just walked out. He didn't even say goodbye to the two soldiers down at the great there. He just went off. But, but, huh? Just go off. My point is, it's the same as number three. He did a very powerful work. He did a great work being resurrected by the Father. All hidden. Unlike Lazarus being raised and everybody saw. Everybody saw how he was raised. We have no idea how the Father raised Jesus Christ. Just don't, I we can, we can speculate but we can never be accurate. And we will never come to the truth. But the fact is that he raised Jesus Christ inside the cave. And he went out the way he went out in John 21. And you may think it's a small factor, but I would like to tell you, it's an invitation to us to be able to do great work in our secret life, in, our, in the secret as well, isn't it? He's, called, he's showing this to us that not all great things are done in the public. Some of your great things you do will be done in secret. And if you want to just only do great works in the public, you'll miss some of the great works that you, are ought, you, ought, you ought to be doing in the private, in the secret as well. Yes, some of our works have to be public, but we also have works to do in the dark, in the cave, in the burial ground, inside a tomb where no one can see us. And in this particular Palm Sunday, yes, all the glorious things will be happening about Jesus. His teaching of uh, the Lord's Supper, His demonstration of humility to be able to serve His disciples by the washing of their feet. And on and on, we can tell you all those outward things. But Jesus' greatest work is done inside a cave. No one can see it. And it will give you much food to reflect on because you will see that that is also a call to us to do some of the greatest work in our life in secret as well. You see, whenever you read heroes and so on, there's some portion of his work called the greatest work. You think of a man like Winston Churchill. Hundreds of biographies have been written about him. And every one of the biographies that's written about Winston Churchill is not about his time as a soldier in the Boer War in South Africa, not as a journalist or as a politician in the House of Commons, but was his time when he was the Prime Minister of Britain during the war years. He was the wartime Prime Minister. He did his greatest work there. And biography after biography will mention this portion of what was the best work that he ever did is always as wartime prime minister in the Second World War. Every one of us, in some sense, have the greatest work to do. But our greatest work may be in public, but chances are most of us can find our greatest work in the secret. And that small little cave, when the Father raised Jesus Christ there, with the, door, with the stone still, you know, closing the door of the cave, He saved all of us. Hallelujah. These are the things that God invites us to do in the secret place. When you, go to the need, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Some of the gifts that you give to people, the greatest work that you can do are all in secret. When you go and pray, go into a room and shut the door and pray to the Father who is in secret 
And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We need to pray public prayers. Come for Wednesday prayer meeting. But also we need to pray in private as well. And it is here Jesus invites all of us to do some of our greatest work when we pray in secret. If you are fasting, then your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This story about Lazarus brings us to face the truth. We have the greatest work to do. Nobody here in this place has no work to do. Every one of us has some work to do. Some of our work will be mediocre, but some of our great work will be the greatest work we ever do, and it's done in secret. If the things that we transact in secret are so far-reaching, we are doing the best work of our life because of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come to this place of Palm Sunday. Yes, we know that Jesus Christ will be exalted in this week as we celebrate the Holy Week. But help us to know that much of what He thought and underwent were all done in the secret place as well. He had far greater works, but He also wants to tell us and invite us to continue His work through prayer, through giving, and through showing mercy as well. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lift up His name. Give Him the praise. Hallelujah. Praise your name. We welcome you. Like the people in Jerusalem, they welcome you into, their, into the city and into their hearts with their praises, Lord. We praise you, Savior of the world. We bless your name. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you and thank you and thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness and mercy each day. No matter how far away we feel, you are always near us. Go with your people today. Go with, to our places, in our workplaces, in our homes. Be with us. Be near us, Lord. Be especially near us, Lord, in these days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. There's coffee upstairs. <laughs>